Get used to using an iPad. Right. Good. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on number that's for number four of our Nautical Nights Winter <laughs> Evening Series this year. And I would just like to say thank you so much for coming in person. I think we have, might have at this point just a few people joining online. Really lovely to see that transition back to in person and to have all your lovely faces one, in front of us once again. It's always hard to gauge how much interest there is and how much people are enjoying the series uh, online. So I'm very grateful to have people in the audience and I know our speaker will be as well. A little housekeeping, uh, particularly for those joining online. But first, if you haven't already, love for you to turn your volume down on your phone, turn it on silent, put it to sleep, whatever you want to do. Nice to do away with your phone for a little while. For those of you joining online, uh, you are more than welcome to engage and ask questions in the chat function on YouTube. If that's not working for you, you're well, more than welcome to send us questions uh, by email at marmus at marmuseum.ca and I will put that email address in the chat or perhaps Doug will as well. Questions of course will be saved for the end and we'll make sure that everybody gets a chance to ask whatever the questions are and of course Dan will be available afterwards for any further conversation and I understand some book signing, lots of books available. So welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. I would also like to thank the Kingston Yacht Club for allowing us to hold our series here at the Yacht Club. It's a long-term partnership and we're very grateful for that partnership. I would first uh, like, to, the Marine Museum would like to acknowledge that the land and the waterways located within the, Great, within the Great Lakes catchment area have a long history predating the establishment of European settlements. The waterways in particular are to be acknowledged as the tra traditional trade routes of indigenous peoples, together providing a network of trade and travel routes essential to communities since time immemorial. The Marine Museum of the Great Lakes at Kingston acknowledges the site it sits on and the water it interacts with to be the traditional territory of the, of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Hiro of the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy and the Huron Wendat people. We thank these nations for their care and stewardship over this land and water, and we were committed to sharing this stewardship moving forward. This evening, uh, we have Dan Buchanan joining us, and I'll like to share a little bit about Dan. Dan Buchanan is the history guy of Brighton, Ontario. He is engaged in many projects related to local and, and Ontario, Ontario history, working from his home in Brighton. Dan tells his stories based on deep dive research into the peoples and events of the time, then presents a coherent story in a narrative form that readers and audience find entertaining and informative. Whether it's a page on his website, a presentation to folks like you, or a published book, stories are told with an emphasis on the people involved, the forces at play in that time and place, as well as the conflicts and moral dilemmas that exist for every generation. Dan is also the creator of the genealogy website treesbydan.com, a database of well over 100,000 individuals. It includes details about early settler families in the area of Prince Edward, Hastings, and Northumberland, and focuses on the interconnections between early settler families uh, rather than the full line of, of each family. Dan published his first book, Murder and the Family, The Dr. King Story, in 2015. It tells the fascinating, fascinating true story of Brighton's infamous murder case in 1859. And in 2018 came 38 Hours to Montreal, which tells the unique story of William Weller's record-breaking sleigh ride from Toronto to Montreal in 1840. To understand both are available for sale. Perfect. That brings us to the book uh, featured in this evening's presentation, The Wreck of HMS Speedy, The Tragedy That Shook Upper Canada, published in 2020. The story is also presented in a five-part series available on YouTube and his website, and we'll share that website link in the YouTube chat. This book presents the story of HMS Speedy, the Br British gunboat that disappeared in a storm near Presqu'ile in 1804. These dramatic events are followed by new information from the diver who believed to have found the remains of Speedy. But the mystery is, but is the mystery solved? I guess we'll find out this evening. So I'd like to, uh, for those of you joining us in person and virtually to help me welcome Dan to the podium. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? I'm gonna get this up just a little bit. I listen to that and I often wonder, when did I have time to sleep over the last couple of years? Well, thank you very much. And uh, good evening, everyone. 
I'm honored to be a guest speaker at Nautical Nights. I've attended a couple of your meetings, both in person and virtually. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I've also been watching the progress over at the museum, and I can't wait to see how that turns out. <clears throat> My talk today is HMS Speedy, Tragedy and Mystery. Tragedy represents the events that happened in 1804 leading up to the loss of the Speedy and all 20 souls on board. Mystery represents the search for the remains of the Speedy, which continues to this day. Normally my presentations are about half and half of those two topics, but tonight I'm gonna to lean a little more towards the mystery. Uh, if you wanna learn more about the tragedy, well, that's mostly what the book is about. Story of H. Miss Speedy has always been part of my life. I grew up on a farm north of Brighton, and in that area, it's part of local lore. And now with the publication of my third book, The Wreck of H. Miss Speedy, The Tragedy That Shook Up Our Canada, my interest in the Speedy story has come full circle. But one might ask, why have I written this book at this time? Here's the answer. In the fall of 2018, I received a phone call just out of the blue. And a few hours later, this box of documents landed on my table. These are the personal papers directly from the office of Ed Burt. He was the diver in Belleville who believed he had found the remains of the Speedy back in the early 1990s. Sadly, Ed passed away in the fall of 2017. And about a year later, his family felt that that history guy in Brighton should have his papers. I had worked with Ed for a few years with his HMS Speedy Foundation, and they felt I might give his story a fair treatment. In fact, they gave me this box of documents to keep, so I didn't have to worry about how long it was going to take. And as I looked through this box of documents, it became clear to me that my next book would be about Speedy. So what was included? in this collection of documents directly from Ed Burt's office. These bound items on the top here, those are annual reports that Ed sent to the ministry based on the survey licenses and the reporting requirements. There were a few three ring binders with pictures and documents. There were a lot of loose leaf folders with correspondence, um, you know, letters, emails, faxes with the people from the ministry, as well as other people he was dealing with through those years just leading up to the uh, survey work. So 1989, 90, 91, 92, and to some degree after that as well. More importantly, this collection includes what Ed used to call the dive sheets. And there's several of these. This is a sheet of paper plus the associated nautical chart that represents the activity of one day's survey work. Now these documents had never been made public before. Ed wouldn't even show them to us <clears throat> when we were working with the HMS Speedy Foundation. So I could kind of sense right away that a book about the Speedy would have extra interest when there was brand new information that nobody had ever seen before. My objectives in writing this book can be demonstrated by the table of contents. First, I wanted to tell the story of HMS Speedy as a proper documented history story and not as a Wednesday night disaster movie. And part one does that, and it takes up the bulk of the book. Part two represents a brief outline of Ed Burt's survey work in the 1990s and some about the situation regarding what he found. Several appendices in the back of the book have a lot more details about that for those who are interested. My objective with this last part was to send a clear message to the marine archeology span community that there is work yet to do on this topic. But before we get into that too much, let's take a quick look at the events leading up to the loss of the Speedy. It began with the murder of John Sharp, who was an employee at a fur trading post that was up there at the northeast corner of Lake Scugog. The place was run by a couple of young brothers, William and Moody Farewell. Well, the next day, everybody was down at the lake shore near 
what in that in those days was called Annis Creek. It's where Oshawa is today. And very quickly, it was determined that a young Mississauga man named Agatonicut had done the deed. And on learning this, his chief, Wabakishiko, was very concerned about the safety of his people. He could see red-coated soldiers coming into his camp with muskets drawn. So the next morning, he led his people to their canoes, and they went to York to turn the young man over to the authorities. At York, Lieutenant Governor Peter Hunter and Chief Justice Henry Alcock were alarmed at this news. They were already dealing with a very tense situation because over the last few years, there'd been several alarms raised suggesting that the indigenous people of Upper Canada were ready to rise up and massacre the whites. Now, these were all totally bogus. They were politically motivated, but they had the desired effect because they made people afraid and uncertain. So it was up to the authorities in Upper Canada at this time to avoid any situation that might inflame emotions in the community. Very quickly, they ordered Agatonica to be arrested. They incarcerated him in the home district jail, which you see here, and the authorities considered their dilemma. They worried that a murder trial at York would inevitably mean the hanging of Agatonica in the yard at the home district jail. And this would happen with all of his family and friends camped just across the bay at Gibraltar Point. So Chief Justice Alcock studied the situation and he came up with a solution. He focused on a law that said that a murder trial must be held in the courthouse of the county of the district town in the district where the crime had taken place. Unfortunately, they didn't know exactly which of the two districts, Home District or Newcastle District, the trading post was in. It hadn't been surveyed that far north yet. So they did a survey, concluded that the trading post was seven and a half miles east of the boundary. So in Newcastle District. So that meant that the murder trial of Agatonica would be held way down the lake at Presqu'il Point, where the new town of Newcastle was which had been designated as the district town for Newcastle District just two years before. So the authorities were relieved, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So HMS Speedy departed York Harbor on Sunday, October 7th, and sailed east towards Newcastle. Over the night, the weather was fine. They were followed by a light westerly breeze. But then during the morning of Monday, October 8th, the wind picked up, and clouds filled the sky. By afternoon, the Speedy was being pushed towards Newcastle by a strong westerly storm. Then at some point later in the evening, we believe, a nor'easter hit the area. We, we know what these are. In the fall, they come out of northern Quebec and blast down across the Great Lakes in northeast to southwest direction. This was a vicious storm. It brought high winds and low temperatures. And it lasted for two full days. HMS Speedy was not seen again. After the storm passed, the folks there at Newcastle spent several days just scouring the shoreline in every direction, just looking for any sign of the Speedy. Not so much as a stick of wood or a piece of clothing was found, nothing. But about two weeks later, Items from the Speedy were sighted off a place called Oak Orchard Creek on the south shore of Lake Ontario, New York State. It was about 40 miles east of Fort George, the military base there at the mouth of the Niagara River. A letter from the commander at Fort George reported to the Lieutenant Governor at York that the name of Paxton was on the lantern of the binnacle. Well, this confirmed what everyone feared. HMS Speedy had in fact been destroyed by that terrible storm on the 8th and there was no hope for the 20 souls on board. So why are we still talking about HMS Speedy more than two centuries later? Well, because the wreck of HMS Speedy has never been found, notwithstanding those few pieces that floated down to the southwest end of the lake. And that brings us up to the 1990s and this fellow, this is Mr. Ed Burt. Ed grew up in Belleville. 
He loved diving from an early age. He obtained an engineering degree at Carleton University in Ottawa. And when he came back home to Belleville, he created two enterprises. First was a metal foundry that specialized in marine products. And second was an underwater exploration and salvage company called Ocean Scan Systems. Ed developed a lot of expertise with the tools of his trade, including this popular sea otter remotely operated underwater video camera. In the summer of 1989, Ed and his crew were training, were conducting training sessions for OPP divers in Lake Ontario off from Presque Isle Point. They were operating over the shallowest part of a large underwater plateau called Dobbs Bank. Now Dobbs Bank can be oriented by saying that it is seven and a half kilometers southeast of Presque Isle Point and about a kilometer and a half to the west of the sand spits that block the west side of Weller's Bay. Suddenly one of the divers came up to the boat and handed Ed a coin that he had found on the ground. Well, Ed immediately identified this coin as a very old vintage. The date 1732 is very obvious on one side and the writing is mostly in Spanish. This was a piece of eight and Ed was intrigued by this find to say the least. Only a few weeks later, Ed and his crew were again working over Dobbs Bank, but this time they were testing a new model of remotely operated underwater video camera. Ocean Scan Systems was an agent in Canada for a company in Massachusetts that sold and maintained underwater exploration products. So during the testing of that day, they dragged the camera under the boat. It took pictures of the ground over Dobbs Bank. The images were sent to the boat through a cable to the computer there and stored in a VHS tape, 1989, so VHS. Well, at the end of the day, Ed took the tape home with him. And that night when he had time, he stuck it into his machine and he sat down to review it, you know, just out of curiosity. Well, he was amazed at what he saw because in this video, under the water, on the ground, he was seeing numerous items that appeared to him to be from a very old shipwreck. So the video and the Spanish coin within a few weeks, we extend Ed on the path toward exploration. To get started with the project, Ed contacted a professional marine archaeologist he knew and showed him the video. Well, the archaeologist said, yes, there's enough here to warrant investigation. And he applied for a marine archaeology survey license for that site for that year. The archaeologist also arranged for what they called protective measures. This is just to avoid unwelcome intrusion during the survey work. Boys were set up around this large triangular area centered around Dobbs Bank. And the boys, the message was that anchorage and diving was prohibited during the survey work. Well, all of this was approved and put in place, but they didn't get out on the lake due to bad weather until June 16th. At that time, Ed and his crew began to follow the grid system that had been set out by the archeologist. That video from the previous year had no location information on it at all. And this is a huge area. So it would be a matter of eliminating one grid square after another until you found what you were looking for. This picture was taken on July 26. It shows Glen Rover, the boat that was used for survey work that first year. And there's, there's Ed, it's hard to see in the dark here, but there's Ed sitting on Avon. This is an inflatable raft that was used as a diving platform. Chief diver and Ed's crew was Terry Coombs, shown here with a scorching sunburn. Terry is a very experienced diver, gained much of his training from the US Navy. So through, through the remainder of the diving season of 1990, the survey work continued, but they failed to locate any of the items that it had seen in the 1989 video. Then, right at the very end of the season, in the middle of October, they hit the mother load. They moved to the next grid square and quickly began to see items scattered around. 
So the last two diving days of the 1990 season were spent simply documenting all these things that they were seeing. In hindsight, Ed would grumble that they had been on the adjoining grid square back in July and just didn't know how close they had been. Such are the vagaries of underwater exploration. Here is the top section of the dive sheet for that day. You see the date, October 20th, 1990. These are forms that are provided by the ministry and you fill them out and send them a copy. Ed was in the habit of writing the names of the people that were on the boat at the top of the sheet, which he's done here. Otherwise, it's really just uh, weather information, water conditions, some of the uh, equipment they were using. Now, the rest of this sheet, which I'm not showing, is columns of handwritten descriptions of the items they were seeing, along with a few coordinates here and there. And that continued on the back of the page as well. Here's a very important point related to survey licenses. The archeological survey license for the 1990 season was applied for and given to a professional marine archeologist. And as a result, the most important clause in that license read, the licensee agrees to retrieve only a limited number of artifacts sufficient to establish full and proper identification of the wreck. That's all fine and dandy, but they hadn't found anything until the very end of the season and only had time to document them. So even though this was in place for the first season, it was never invoked. Then in the spring of 1991, the professional marine archeologist decided not to return to the Speedy project. The marine archeologist was Ken Cassavoy. You may recognize that name. He was a, an award-winning marine archeologist. And in the early 1990s, he was very busy. And he wrote an article in the second annual archeological report for Ontario in 1991. And the introduction includes these words. The videotape evidence suggested the presence of a shipwreck. And given the nature of some of the evidence, the possibility that this wreck could be the Speedy was not an unreasonable one. Then later in the summary, when he's talking about the results for the 1990 survey season, he said that they were inconclusive, which is also reasonable. But it's kind of interesting because the discovery of artifacts at the very end of the season is hardly mentioned, only to suggest that they should continue the next year. It's in real heavy contrast to the jubilation that Ed and his people felt when they found these items after a summer of hard work. I was able to have a telephone conversation with Mr. Casfoy. He was very grace, uh, graceful with his time. Now, he told me that there were two reasons why he left the project. One was that he just hadn't seen any evidence that this was the Speedy they were dealing with. And second was he had major projects going on that were much more certain that he needed to spend time on. In effect, the results of this change were profound for the Speedy project. The most critical impact was that the survey license for the 1991 season would be applied for and given to Ed Burt, who was not a professional marine archeologist. And because of, the, because of this, the critical clause in that license said, Retrieval of artifacts from underwater sites is not covered under this license. The enforcement of this clause, along with the absence of a marine archeologist on the project would hamstring the entire enterprise for the next two years. And even now that they'd actually found artifacts, the next spring, they were now not able to bring any of them out of the water to investigate, to try to identify the wreck. Later licenses would use the term do not disturb, which meant total hands off everything you found. Needless to say, this situation was very annoying for Ed Burt. And he was loud in his displeasure, both verbally and on paper. So after three seasons of survey work, what did they find? 
They found a debris field. No, it's not a sunken ship, you know, like you see in National Geographic or recreational diver magazines. It's a very large debris field covering several square kilometers with clusters of items here and there, mostly to the west end of Dobbs Bank. So remember this, please. It was a debris field. This is one of the most compelling images taken from the 1989 video. Over here on the right, we see a pair of spectacles. Down in the middle here is a clay pipe. Over on the left is a cannonball. And back in behind here is one of those long, narrow, square, black glass bottles. And you can see the cork is still in place. Well, even with this foggy image, the archaeologist for that first year was interested in this because they could at least begin to date all four of these items to the very early 1800s, which would suggest an unusually old shipwreck for Lake Ontario. Another image from the 1989 video shows this small cannon. You can see the outline of it here. Chief diver Terry Coon stood over this and said what, what was interesting to him was this Sorry, this round raised area here. He said it was, it looked like a, a crest or a coat of arms. He thought it might have identifying information. But he also knew that the license they were working under at the moment said, do not disturb. So he didn't scrape the moss off the crest. Where there are cannon, there are cannonballs. Here are just four of the various cannonballs that were identified across the debris field <clears throat> during the survey work. Some of those easily identified items were the masts. We know that Speedy was a twin mast schooner. Now, initially these were seen on the monitor in the boat and they thought they might just be logs. But when the diver went down to look, he saw that there were two of them. They were lying fairly close together and they were identical. And on a little further investigation, you can see that they were manufactured. The tapering at one end is the end that went into the deck. Another image from the 1989 video is identified as a ship's bell. You can see it, it's lying on its side beside some rocks. It's covered in very thick moss. Well, the chief diver stood over this and said, once you got close to it, it was obviously a ship's bell. But the question remains today, is the name HMS Speedy underneath the moss there on this bell? After all the survey work, one big question remains on the topic of photographs. Now the images of artifacts that I've shown you here are mostly stills from that 1989 video. Now a VHS tape, as you can see here, was included in the box of documents I received in 2018. And it contained a copy of that 1989 video, along with some other videos of divers exploring through shipwrecks. So I had the contents of that tape digitized so I can play it on the computer. So these are the only images that I've seen of artifacts, which means that I haven't seen any of the color images that were taken by the 35 millimeter color system that was on the boat. Terry Coon says that he took literally hundreds of pictures with this system, but where are they? There were none of them in the box I received in 2018. And when you ask Terry Coons about it, he just kind of grins and said, well, Ed had them and nobody knows what he did with them. It's another mystery related to HMS Speedy. At the end of the 1992 diving season, the funding for the protective measures expired and Ed Bird had to get back to revenue generating work. In fact, for Ed, the Speedy project had been a money pit. Well, in following years, he undertook a persistent promotional campaign trying to spread the word about the work they'd done and what they'd found. He created the HMS Speedy Foundation and used it to promote the project. He did many speaking engagements had interviews with newspaper reporters, even did t-shirts and you know the crest here you see, Oop, sorry. Ed also developed the idea that a marine museum should be built 
to house all those artifacts that they should bring up from the Speedy site. And his preferred location for that museum was right out there at the end of Preskeel Point by the lighthouse. In fact, HMS Speedy Foundation made a proposal to Preskeel Provincial Park that the interpretive center, which was out there near the lighthouse, be expanded to include the Speedy Museum. Unfortunately, nobody was interested in a marine museum, especially not the folks at Preskeel Provincial Park. But in spite of all the opposition, Ed persisted in promoting the idea. Ed also continued to apply for survey licenses long after there was no survey work being done after the 1992 season. It was no secret, Ed hated doing reports to the ministry. So I wasn't surprised during my research to find out that by early 2005, he was so far behind in his annual reporting requirements, which are written right into the licenses, that the ministry finally put their foot down. They told him that he would get no more new licenses unless he at least made an attempt to bring his reporting into compliance. And that resulted in the HMS Speedy Project Report for 1997. I still have no idea whatever why Ed put the date 1997 in the title of this project report. It has absolutely nothing to do with the content in the document. In his own contrarian way, Edbert would use this opportunity to provide a full-throated version of what he believed had happened to the Speedy. He'd been leading up to this for a long time, and it all came cascading out in the 1997 project report. 120 pages, many filled with complex technical details about this or that little issue that may have impacted the route that the Speedy took or the nature of its demise. He used all of his pictures and charts and maps to lend context to his ideas. It was really quite a production. Of course, the audience for that document was not the people at the Ontario Ministry that managed marine archaeology licenses. In fact, they probably would have turned their nose up at this document. The most important page in the 1997 project report was this nautical chart, which Ed created to show the estimated route that the Speedy may have taken. It's highlighted there in the dark blue line. So as Ed told the story, the Speedy was sailing from the west at night and pushed by a strong westerly storm. Captain Paxton was not able to make this difficult turn into Presqu'ile Bay. So the ship was blown off to the east into Weller's Bay. In 1804, there weren't nearly the sand spits blocking Weller's Bay that we see today. So Captain Paxton would have been happy to ride out the storm However, this is when his luck ran out because this is when that nor'easter hit the area. And the nor'easter, blowing in that northeast to southwest direction, forced the Speedy back out into Lake Ontario. The dramatic climax of the story comes when the Speedy collides with a large rock that was just a few inches below the surface of the water right there on that shallowest point of Dobbs Bank. This was a violent collision. The hull cracked like an egg. The deck hang split apart in seconds. The mass toppled over and along with the people and the baggage, everything ended up in the raging lake waters. The 20 people on board would have died in the collision or within seconds as the ship disintegrated around them. Then as that nor'easter continued to howl, in a northeast to southwest direction, many items from the ship would gradually sink down in the water and find a resting place over Dobbs Bank. Larger items that would float would be blown off into Lake Ontario to the southwest. 
Now, the events I've just described represent what Edbert believed had happened to the Speedy. This is what he believed in 20, 2005 when he wrote this report, and it's what he believed when the day died in 2017. Of course, some of these details in a 1997 project report we must identify as speculation. Look, Ed Burt was an engineer, and he knew what he had seen on the ground over Dobbs Bank during his survey work. And he believed he needed to provide a dramatic and compelling story that would explain how every piece of that ship could end up in that location and in that condition as he had seen during his survey work. Of course, we might call it reverse engineering. Question all often comes to me, well, why has nothing happened about this? And it's a good question. There's several people, ways to look at this. Ed Burt's approach to dealing with historical marine artifacts was very traditional. You know, you spend lots of money to go exploring. You risk life and limb to go diving, looking for things. And if by chance you find something that might have historical value, you bring it out of the water and put it in a museum for all to see. He and his diving companions have been doing it for a long time, been done for centuries. However, the world had changed. A new philosophy was taking hold in the marine archaeology world. And it was represented by the phrase, leave it in the water. Preservation became paramount. And this is not just here. This was happening all over the world. And for good reason. Because so many marine archaeology sites had been damaged or completely destroyed by treasure seekers or just recreational divers looking to bring a souvenir home. And now that that philosophy was being reflected directly in legislation in organizations like the Ontario Ministry that manages marine licenses, a huge conflict came to the fore, developed between the divers and the archeologists. And Ed Burke and the HMS Speedy were right there at ground zero of this conflict. But we also must consider the man himself. Edbert was a very confident fellow. He didn't like being told what he could or couldn't do, especially if the person telling him was a young person carrying a briefcase. And evident, evidence shows that Ed's interpersonal relations with, like relations with the marine archeologist on the project, as well as the ministry people, were not pleasant, to say the least. And the result of this was that the marine archaeology community as a whole disowned Edbert and the Speedy Project. But it was more than that. It became a conviction that remains of HMS Speedy could never be found anywhere in this region. Over time, these ideas became entrenched and they became conventional wisdom. During my research, I spoke to several people from the marine archeology span world. I mentioned HMS Speedy and Ed Bird, and I always got the same mantra. Oh, that guy was a kook and he found nothing. I must beg to differ. So what has happened since the book came out? Have you ever seen this book, Shipwrecks of Lake Ontario? In late 2020, the author of this book, Jim Kennard, contacted me about the Speedy story. Now, Jim lives on the south side of Lake Ontario. He hadn't seen the book, but he had seen all the videos that are on my website. And, you know, without any exaggeration, we can call Jim Kennard the greatest shipwreck hunter on Lake Ontario. And you need to look at this book to see how. In fact, Jim and his crew were the ones that found HMS Ontario back in 2008. This ship was built and sank in the same year of 1780. So during the War of Independence, which makes it one of the oldest shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. 
Now the wreck is almost totally intact, well-preserved, but it's in really deep water, the west end of the lake, so hard to access. Up, upper left here in the picture is a scale model of HMS Ontario, which is located at the Marine Museum of the Great Lakes in Kingston. Well, Jim Kennard was very interested in this situation regarding the search for the remains of the Speedy. And my discussions with Jim resulted in contact with another interested party, Doug Howie, who we know as the manager of the Marine Museum of the Great Lakes in Kingston. And needless to say, I was delighted to talk to these two gentlemen about the Speedy story. So over several months, many emails and phone calls took place between the three of us. Jim and Doug were both fascinated by the material in Ed's papers and made it clear that they felt something should happen as a result. And these folks have connections in high places in the marine archeology span community in Canada. And eventually that led to contact with Jonathan Moore, the senior marine archeologist at Parks Canada. I sent Jonathan a copy of the book. And later on, when he voiced some interest, I sent some of the documents from Ed Burt's papers. As a result, Jim and Doug and I had a Zoom call with Jonathan and a few others in the spring of 2021. In fact, on that night, Jonathan spoke to us from his cabin in the David Thompson, Parks Canada's research vessel. They were docked at Prescott and they were planning the very next day to go north to do more work on the Erebus and Terror. You know, the Franklin expedition. Well, that trip got canceled, so they didn't go, but that's a high priority for them. But in our meeting, Jonathan made very clear what his opinion was now that he'd seen the book and some of the documents I sent him. He said that he just had not seen the type of evidence that the archaeologists at Parks Canada would need in order to look seriously at artifacts there on Dobbs Bank. Besides, I mean, their resources got messed around with COVID like everybody else. So any suggestion of a project by Parks Canada to look at the Speedy was just not on the table at all. However, he did say that they would be receptive to receiving new evidence and that they would look at that new evidence with a fresh eye. Well, this may not seem to be much progress. But it is. I look at it as a door left ajar, waiting for somebody to come by and push it open. Then in the spring of 2022, I dropped into Dive Force Scuba down at the south end of Dufferin Street, Trent. Dave Burnside and his wife Nancy, who owned the store, were interested in my pitch. On February 1st, 2023, Dave hosted an event at Dive Force Scuba where I was the guest speaker. And in, I invited my special guest, Terry Coons, the chief diver from Ed's crew. Terry lives in Belleville and he's always happy to talk about his experiences. Well, I gave presentation, kind of explained the situation and we had close to two hours of lively discussion. And I can say as a result of this event, that I have made contact with some folks who are interested in doing something about this and actually may have the means to do it, which is critical. That's all I can say. It's an early stage. The objective of this project would be to relocate some of the artifacts that Ed and his crew found over Dobbs, <clears throat> Dobbs Bank in 1990. We have Ed's dive sheets and the associated nautical charts with all those red X's and the coordinates on them. And if those artifacts are still there, we should be able to relocate some of them. And if we can do that, we need to take a whole bunch of beautiful high resolution photographs and all of that material will be bundled together and sent off to the, to the archeologists at Parks Canada. And they hopefully will review all of that new evidence with a fresh eye, as they said. And of course, depending on whatever, this might result in a recommendation for next steps. Well, at this point, I can't say what's gonna happen. 
You know, it's kind of out of my hands. But if the right people with the right tools and knowledge are interested in trying to solve this longstanding historical anomaly, I'm going to be there to help. As a historian, I don't like historical anomalies. But in the meantime, I will maintain a positive outlook, but I'm not holding my breath waiting. I've got a lot of other history to do. But that includes continuing to tell the story of HMS Speedy simply because it is a fascinating part of Canadian history. That is the story of HMS Speedy, the tragedy and the mystery. I hope you enjoy the book, The Wreck of HMS Speedy, The Tragedy That Shook Up Her Canada, available widely in bookstores, libraries, and online in numerous ways. Borrow it from somebody if you have to. Please look at my website, danbuchananhistoryguy.com. And as was mentioned earlier, there's a couple of things there I'll highlight. Yes, I've created a five-part video series that really mirrors the content of the book. So if you prefer video rather than book, help yourself to that. There's also a section here called Extra Info. And this is, well, more about the tragedy side, but it's topics that I had to research that were kind of peripheral to the story, but I had to understand them myself and that didn't maybe end up in the book. So there's downloadable files and whatnot. If you're interested, help yourself to all that material. Well, that's the story of HMS Speedy, Tragedy and Mystery. Thanks so much for your attention, folks, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Oh, right in the questions. Yes. How do they know that they saw the, the fire on the shore? If you had to get so far west to see the fire on the shore, how did they know that they got that far west? Okay. This story has been told many different ways. All right. The way I've told it is based on documentation. Oh, um, it was about seeing the beacon fire when Captain Paxton was trying to get into Presque Isle Bay because the people at, at Newcastle were in the habit of putting a beacon fire. They had no lighthouses in those days. So he was in, they were in the habit of putting, building a fire out on Little Salt Point. It was just inside from the main point of the bay um, with the idea that Captain Paxton out there would see it and come back in towards it. Um, I don't believe anybody at Presque Isle ever saw Speedy. I know it's, that is said in some stories, but I don't believe that would be the case. Um, what we do know from documentation is that the Speedy was sighted that earlier, that probably in the late afternoon that day, it was off um, just east of Port Hope. There was a little place in there, of course, that was before the cities were there and anything, it was 1804. Uh, there was a place called um, Dean's Creek <clears throat> because of the Dean people settled there. Sorry, I was just going to say the name of the creek today, but I forget. Um, it's where the the car dealership there is. There's a Marsh. that whole marshy area. That's a conservation area, right? Just a little tiny creek. Anyway, two people that were coming to the trial by canoe stopped there for the night because the weather was getting bad and they say they saw the speedy about a mile offshore going towards newcastle so from actual documentation from the people who were there at the time that information is actually in the obituary of moody farewell um i know lots of people have written lots of other things <laughs> and that's part of why i did this book was because the speedy story has been such lore and it's been told so many different times for dramatic effect. You know, magazine articles, newspaper articles, that kind of thing. But I really had to set all that stuff aside and look for the original documents, documents from the time period as much as possible. So that's, that's what you'll see in the book about what happened to the Speedy, is that approach. Any other questions? Yes? Really, uh... Treasure hunt in Ontario Water Council at Presque Isle for 
Why do I go over and over and over again? Why is God over? Yeah. And one of the parts of the story, and it was taken from an old text. I think it was 1890. It was read from. And in the story, they they mentioned that the Anaganaga was on a stand-up only cage, vertical cell, small, strapped to one of the masts. And that's what it was. Well, if you were, if you have any uh, background information from when it left York, whether it actually he was in manacles or was he was this whole cage just part of the cage? No, in a store in a eighteen oh four. A small British schooner, which was designed for freight, was. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I keep forgetting. I've got a dual thing here. Um, question had to do about what was the method that Agatonicut was fastened in the ship, if I can rephrase whatever. Um, there's no specific documentation about that. Um, nothing credible that I've seen. But just looking at the ship, the time period, uh, Agatonica would simply have been sent down into the hold, which was a very tiny place. You couldn't stand up in it. And he would have been fastened to a piece of the hold by chains and watched by a couple of soldiers. So there's lots of dramatic constructs that have been added to the story over the years. And, you know, they've been effective in selling magazines and newspapers and whatnot. But I've never really kind of been happy with the whole story. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's all I can answer to that. So the reason that I asked is because I wonder if anyone had ever run a magnetometer scan of that area. Okay. I I, I, still I probably shouldn't get into this, but I'll tell you one thing. One of the things that they did find, it was actually in Sorry, the follow up to the question. I can't remember this. Um, Okay, it was about where if they found any of the chains that would have held him in the deck, that kind of thing. With well, sure, everybody uses magnetometers. That's not the point. The video done in 1989 actually has a section where the camera is going over this area, and Ed has speaking spe speaks over it, and he's saying, "Well, and here coming up here is a ball and chain." with mos moccasins. Uh, I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it. It's foggy, right? This foggy picture from the 1989. Ed made a big deal of it. Well, here's obviously, you know, Agatonica, he was in chains, he was in a hold, and there's his Indian moccasins there. Um, there's actually two pair of moccasins within a few feet on the ground there. And it does look like that's what they are. And it is a piece of chain. And there's a ball in the end of it. So until we go and look and actually study those things, again, that's one of hundreds of things that archaeologists need to look at. I can't make an evaluation. Sorry, yes. I spent a lot of time and a time sailing in that area. And one of the things that I noticed is that it's The objects you found are so scattered that you can really have evidence of where objects are. Then the film was made in 1989. That's what we're looking for. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. He's asking about. Um, that area out there, there's a there's a current all the time, yeah. and he's asking if we have any better evidence of what those things are that were seen in 1989. And the answer is no. I mean, that's there's only one project to look at those things, and once Ed finished, nobody else went there. Nobody else looked because the archaeology community disowned him <laughs> and disowned the idea that there was anything there. <laughs> um, so. That's exactly why we need to do what we're planning, hoping to be able to do, is to try to relocate some of those things and really get good modern pictures of them. Well, first of all, confirm they're there. Like, if we can confirm that they're there, then we can lend a lot more credibility 
to this box of documents and the work that was done there in the early 1990s. Right now, you know, there's a whole cloud over the credibility of that work. And probably for good reason, Ed Burt was kind of a nasty guy. <laughs> Hey, they're asking what's the depth of water there? Well, okay, so I mentioned it's a large underwater plateau, seven and a half kilometers southeast of Presqu'ile Point. So it's out in the lake, deep lake all around. The plateau is kind of weird shaped. Well, you can see the picture of it. Um, the shallowest point on that plateau is on that north edge. There's a place where the edge is fairly straight east and west right towards the west part of that straight section on the north side, that is when it comes right up to the surface. Uh, and if you go with a boat there, you can actually see there's just a pile of rubble a meter or two down. You can see that sh sh a shallowest point, but then it goes down gradually, gradually with these limestone shelf drops every few hundred yards to the west and to the south from there. And most of the uh, diving that was done was done in, you know, five or 10 or 15 meters. So it's not deep. Uh, you know, and the, around the edge of it, they weren't diving off the edge of it because the lake is deep out away from it. But they found all these things that they found on that plateau, on Dobbs Bank. Well, it would get deeper at points. Again, it was just, it gets most of the items they saw, a lot of them that are identified were up towards that north side, but there's clusters in various places that they identified during the survey work. Uh, so it is spread around again, a debris field. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there any evidence of uh, recreational divers going in there since then and filtering things? Yeah, good question. Is there any evidence of recreational divers going in there and taking things? Um, not that I've seen, but again, I'm not there and I'm not watching, so it's possible, but I'll add this, and I'm not a diver or a boater, so take my words from that standpoint, but I've been told this, that that is not a place that recreational divers go. Um, again, it's way out in the lake, it is deep all around, and this is rough water. I mentioned the current earlier. There's constant currents there that are just sweeping over this plateau and it's different directions every day. <laughs> As a matter of fact, some of the problems they had with the diving was that the direction of the current would change just in a minute and it would go hard one way and then it would go hard another because at the east end of Lake Ontario, with just with the geography and water dynamics and water, I'm no expert at that, but the divers knew very well. It's close to a dangerous place to dive if you've got the right equipment and the right expertise, these two, these guys were very experienced divers. Terry Coons had no problem with any of this, but it's not the place that recreational divers normally would go. Uh, yes. Time I was in command of the British Navy, and sailing through that area, generally the lightning stings, you could notice the shifting of the weapon. You talked to a lot of school sports. It shifted, and it actually gave me the impression from back to sea. Where you could always encounter some kind of current. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very tricky place to dive, certainly. And this was what I got all of this from Terry Coons. Ed told us to some degree, but Terry was more the source for this kind of information. And in that, yeah, um, they had rough water out there a lot. So there were so many days that they had to come back in because it was just too rough. Yes, at the back. And you said Jonathan Moore? Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope to talk to him again. <laughs> Certainly. Yes, at the back. Oh, yeah. What, what happened to the coin? Yes. Good question. Um, no, I know about that. Uh, what you saw there was um, an image that um, Ed's, actually in the last two decades of Ed's life, he uh, 
while he was divorced. And then he had a friend who was his companion for the last years, and she had all of his stuff. And one of the things that she showed me was this coin. I, I'd seen pictures of it. Um, actually, I'd seen it where it is, is in the Marine Museum down in the county. Um, they he, Ed donated it there years ago. Um, but the, his, the, his companion had these really good picture of it because um, I had I wanted to see what it looked like in details. But yeah, that's what happened to it. it's in that Marine Museum down there, which is an appropriate place for it, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. You know I'm a believer. But, uh, <laughs> why would Ed make on the chart the, a kind of convoluted story where he envisions this beauty going westward, uh, westward, not being able to round up north into the bay and back west onto it, being blown in the shallows, and then being hit by a nor'easter and coming back out. Why, why couldn't they have simply just been blown westerly right onto the, the region? Why speculate that he was blown in and back out? He's asking about the complexity of Ed's story about what happened to the Speedy. And you're right, it is interesting. But I think you, again, need to take it from the standpoint that Ed was this engineer type. And he was great with the equipment. Uh, and he, I, I go back to the same thing. He kept telling me this when I talked to him. He said, I saw these things on Dobbs Bank. I know that they're there. I know what they are. He, had, he was very sure about it. And he had seen so many different things that all looked like they were from an old ship that he was very certain that it was the Speedy. So he said, okay, my engineering mind comes to work. And I says, well, how could that, those pieces end up there? I mean, that, that's not by mistake. Something happened for them to end up there. And he put all of these things together because he needed to have an end result where the ship exploded into pieces and sank right there on Dobbs Bank. Now, I will ask what other thing would happen to make that the end result? But that's how his thinking was, was to say, okay, I've seen this stuff. I know it's there and I know that it's from an old ship. So how did it get there? And of course, he'd studied the history and he knew the area, he knew the geography. One of the things that I didn't mention here that he also knew was that in the 19, or sorry, in the 1880s and 90s, there was a historian in Brighton called Isaac Wellington. Um, he wrote extensively about the history of Presqu'ile and about the Speedy story. Because his grandfather was George Gibson who had been there lighting the beacon fire. So he was directly involved, his family was involved. And when he wrote the Speedy story, he didn't start out with the Speedy coming from York. He started out with, oh, the day after it was lost, we all went out and tried to find the Pinnacle Rock. The Pinnacle Rock, they knew there was a rock out there that was just a few inches below the surface of the water. It had been reported. It hadn't been reported to the authorities because there's no record of it at all, like before 1804 in the military marine records. And they spent several days, not only looking for pieces of the Speedy, but looking for this pinnacle rock, which they had seen several times before, but they couldn't find it again. So the theory was that the Speedy must have run into it and knocked the rock off. And if you look at the rubble down there underneath that spot, you might be able to picture that. Anyway, Ed saw that and he kind of automatically linked that into, well, if they hit a piece of rock that was out there on Dobbs Bank on that shallowest point where it was really shallow, that's the only way that all those items could end up in that place in that manner. So it was a, a logic. Now, the thing, the thing that really got too far was this thing about going into Weller's Bay and coming back. I mean, who knows if that actually happened, but he had to, 
he had to make a very interesting story, you know, and he had all these things he wanted to fit them all together. And it's kind of ingenious, but we know we must know that it's not fact. It was his conjuring things together. It is reverse engineering. You know, we don't like to see that very much, but it is reverse engineering. It's maybe the best information we have right now. That's why we really need to look at these things to see, you know, if they are what he thought they were. Are all those things from the same ship? Are they from the time, same time period? What Ed also knew was that there's been no, he dove in this whole area for years from when he was a kid. He never heard anybody from any position, no history about any ship ever being lost over Dobbs Bank. He knew this. So when he saw that stuff, he said, okay, this is, there's no record of this. So the, another, again, another thing put together. Who's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it it was very different in 1804. You know, he was talking about Weller's Bay and yes, over here. Okay, good question. Asking about the items that were found in the southwest side of the lake a few weeks later as to where, where if do we have them? And no, unfortunately, we don't. I've never seen any evidence of that. Um, in those days, they certainly wouldn't have kept stuff like that. It was, uh, well, it's what kicked off the mourning period. Because when they were able to report that from the Lieutenant Governor's office, that it was confirmed. I mean, for two weeks, everybody had been on tender hooks, not, not knowing what happened. They knew the ship was late, but they didn't know for sure until these items came up. And it's just kind of lucky that the binnacle, I mean, I don't need to, have to ask what the binnacle is. Um, in those days, it was a wooden thing that held the uh, instruments and the captain always had a lantern on top of that that had his name engraved on it. Um, and that's what they saw. Paxton, Thomas Paxton was the captain. So that's the only real evidence that linked it together. And that kicked off a mourning period that lasted for, lasted for decades. Um, it was a huge disaster for the people at the time. That's what I tried to get forward in the book as well that has never been talked about. Yes, sir. So I got the thing. Well, again, Ed Burt's answer to you is says, well, it hit a rock and the ship exploded. So the big pieces went down closer to the area. Well, I'm not sure the masts would float. They were big, pretty big, heavy pieces. I don't know. I'm not an expert at that. So it's a good question. But yeah, there was a, quite a number of, and there was pieces of decking. Mostly it's covered up by moss and stuff now. But there was pieces of decking that they had pictures of as well. Well, uh, good question. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I can't answer that. Oh, well, just asking about what, what items would have been, well, the wooden items. Yeah. Um, well, there's all sorts of questions about why would this end up there and why would that end up here and whatnot. But, you know, I, I, this is the kind of thing that archaeology does, right? That's the kind of thing archaeology answers. 
or help us to answer. So until we can actually have some science, it's all just speculation. So, yes. So in your original map there, you talked about them going to trial at Newcastle. What I recall on the map, you seem to show Newcastle owned by Chris Peel. And Newcastle today is a between Bowling and Bowling for Hope. So am I missing something there? Or did something get renamed? Yep. Good question. The question is about the conflict about Newcastle. Uh, yes, the original town of Newcastle was on Preskill Point. It was right there along that, on the, along the bay shore, like where the cottages are from the dock area up towards the lighthouse. That was the town of Newcastle. It was surveyed in 1796. Um, Simcoe wanted it to be a county town when he was there, because it was because Preskill Bay was the best um, natural harbor between York and Kingston. So in 1802, actually, when they created Newcastle District, the town was established there as the district town with the courthouse and the jail, the center of government there. Um, so it was in place for two years. They'd already had the Azizas once at least, and everybody was coming to the Azizas in the fall for this one, but it, they didn't happen because the Speedy didn't arrive. But that would be Newcastle there until uh, in the 1920s, they moved Newcastle over to the, to the north shore of the bay. And in the 1840s, that was named Gosport. Now, they did that at that time because the town of Newcastle up towards the west that we know about, the larger town, was starting, was actually named and starting to grow. And that was the bigger place. And the post office needed to get their duplicates out of the system. And that's why they named Gosport gave Gosport its name. So yes, there's uh, definitely a history there. Anybody else? Thanks so much for the question, folks. As you can tell, I love doing questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's me freelance a little bit. So is that good? Yes. Back in the bright light. <laughs> Wasn't important. <laughs> uh, thank you very, very much, Dan. That was a, a wonderful presentation. Definitely learned a lot. And uh, now I'm on my hunt to finish reading the book. <laughs> I meant to bring it this evening to have a sign, but I'll have to wait till next time. So uh, yes, thank you very much for everyone for joining. Please have a If you have any outstanding questions, you're more than welcome, of course, to uh, speak with Dan afterwards. He's got his books uh, for sale. For those of you online, if you miss sending in your questions, please do so. You can send them by email and I'll make sure they get forwarded on to Dan and he can respond to you directly. Otherwise, I would like to thank you everyone for again for joining us this evening, both in person and virtually. And of course, our next one is on the 22nd of March and that's Pierre's song, The Boat Plays of Portsmouth with Marie Edwards, who's one of actually our, one of our volunteer librarians and speaker alumnus, David Moore. That will be their penultimate presentation for the season. And the last one is on the 29th of March with Daniel McFarlane talking about Niagara Falls and the politics around Niagara Falls. So a couple of great presentations coming up, but uh, again, thank you very much again for joining us. So pleased to have you finally. Thank you. So when you look at a ship like that, okay, it's buoyant because it displaces a certain amount of water. But when it goes down to a shipwreck, it goes down as an aggregate weight, bringing everything down. So over the years, all the radiation.